Welcome to the Vibrant Living Network. Have you ever wondered what is possible beyond possible? What is the thing you've been wondering and inquiring about? Are you just feeling stuck and don't know why? Are you thinking or are you seeing? Seeing allows us to expand and have this other experience. We want to invite you for that wake-up call. We want to invite your spirit, your soul, so to be more alive, more connected. Glenn Brooks has been a life coach for over 33 years, author of Divorced to Patterns, Not Each Other, an explorer of what is possible. He has worked with people all around the world. Join us for a wake-up conversation, a dialogue with you. We will have some of the most interesting contributors. We will be talking to some of the most interesting people and have some of the most resourceful teachers, wisdom-filled people from around the world join us. Share your voice, ask the questions, become free of the known into a new world of possibility. We are going to talk about all the things you wonder about, how to live, how to heal, how to connect, how to love, how to be seen. Your life is precious. Enjoy it. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Wonderful having you with us on the Vibrant Living Network. I'm Glenn Brooks, and I wanted to take a a, a die or an explanation about writing today. Writing and your vibrant book, your vibrant message, and also uh, your speaking. And I want to leave you with my my advice that I give to writers. How I how I the, the world of writers opened up to me when I picked up a book called The Miracle of Fasting by Paul Bragg. And I probably picked that book up when I was 18 or 19 and fairly close proximity to, to meeting a, a world-class uh, fashion model, Tony DeMarco. And her book was about, was, her book was called The California Way to Natural Beauty. And it was about how cosmetics were making her ill. I met Tony at a, at a health expo and she gave me her phone number. And next thing I knew, I was at her apartment planning a seminar. Now this is all, I want to say this was all unscripted. The last thing I knew, I was falling asleep in high school, feeling like I was pretty dumb because I couldn't get what was going on. So through Paul Bragg and Tony, I realized that authors that were, were wanted to uh, reveal vibrant messages were my kindred spirits. And I kept meeting authors. So the first time I was on, I was on radio, I started to meet writers. And I realized, oh, the publishers don't really get these authors. They don't really get these vibrant authors. They're kind of a a niche of people, a huge niche of people. I want to give a shout out to Deepak Chopra. We're going to have him on as a in the, in the new year. We can celebrate the anniversary of having a relationship with Deepak. The the book that he wrote, by the way, that changed my life was called Ageless Body, Timeless Mind. To this day, t- very powerful title. So. Let's get into this vibrant writing thing. And I want to acknowledge that today, Kevin Anderson was supposed to be with us from Kevin Anderson Associates. He'll be with us next week. He's one of our, our partners on, on vibrant writing. So I want to just check to see if, uh, Lisa, are you here today? Lisa? Lisa LaRose? No, not Lisa LaRose. And what about Jana Carafa? My, my uh, road to Carnegie Hall inside teacher. All right. She's, she's in Kauai. So, um, Let's begin this way. So last week we, we did a feature. Well, first of all, let, please all introduce yourself. We got Dr. Dr. Gail Wisdom Filled Randall, former professor at UCLA, and she's uh, currently in, in practice as a longevity medical doctor, spiritual healer, wisdom advisor. We maintain a very close connection as she's been. She came in my life as a result of a crisis that I went through, and. It was a crisis into a new blessing. So maybe that'll be the theme of the show. Is let's talk about authors and speakers that really want to convey this message of vibrancy beyond circumstance, beyond what you think you've known from the past or your friends told you or your family told you. So my, my relationship with, with Dr. Randall has been a, one of, uh, of discovery and appreciation and also demonstrate we actually do need each other. And I'm profoundly grateful in this moment of our relationship and all the stuff you've shared and, and stepping beyond the known with you. Welcome, Dr. Gail Randall. Hi. Good morning for me. Good, af- good afternoon for you. And welcome in this holiday season, the last full moon of the year, which is pretty amazing. And um, I'm looking forward to our courses coming up, Healing Beyond Yes, Belief. me too. Me too. Very much. And as I work on my own book, 
yes. soul doctor, heal, heal, heal yourself, heal the planet, um, almost every teaching point is about healing beyond belief. So it's going to be very exciting. <laughs> I'm very excited. I'm very excited. Welcome, welcome. Um, welcome. Deeply welcome. Sherry Marquez, here she is. I feel like I've known. I came, I came in this lifetime. This is going to be a bold statement. I came in this lifetime not really ever feeling like what was known around me, what was known around me, the usual beliefs, the ideas of the day had anything to do with what had meaning to me. I didn't get it at all. I, I picked up my first book, by the way, I was thinking of talking about authors and message. And here we are in the middle of helping Sherry write her new book, The Dog Mystic, be, on being in deep tune with your dog, being on deep, deep tune with your dog. I have some stories about, about dog books that have transformed my life. Um, so basically, I when I would meet authors and when I would listen to people, I was listen, I was listening for this other message. And when I met Sherry, I realized the other message had to be with how do we understand how do we re, re, relate to dogs in a way that's totally different than what we've been conditioned. Like in today's conditioning, the craziness that we project on dogs causes a lot of violence and. And stuff that doesn't need to happen. I know Sherry's mission is to educate you, not just on the on the linear practical things you could do, but also on this other side, which has to do with the mystery of the dog's energy, how it impacts you, the dog's intelligence, the, the wonder of the dogs, and, and things that we want you to describe as being part of our dog mystic community. So Sherry, I'm going to put you on the author seat. Now, last week, last week, you did a segment on uh, on crating something by the way I've heard of crating in recent days I didn't grow up with crating no one personally created me although I felt that way um, yeah thank you um, and I also want okay I, I gotta acknowledge Jen Sherry because you're always wanting me to have everybody's voice resonate so before you respond I want to introduce our new our shiny new vibrant Colorado coordinator I'm giving you that big title right now about vibrant living wow. vibrant Colorado I've that had makes a lot of. So I know, I know. It's almost like you're the you're the major, you're the major, you're the happening at the bar mitzvah almost. You know what I mean? You're like the you're the mitzvah of the gathering. I like it. <laughs> Maybe. So why, why don't you say something? I want to say this way. Sherry Sherry's really good. She always likes the initiation of all the voices, and I'm thinking that is great. So, share something, and then we'll go to Sherry because Sherry wants to elaborate a little bit on the the crating segment. We she used the word separation six and a half times last week, so we'll get into that. Too. <laughs> well, first, I um, say welcome, everyone. Welcome, and welcome, what? Jen. She's <laughs> 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 um, saying my name, so she's saying welcome. So, welcome. <laughs> welcome. <laughs> um, I'm Jennifer Rowe, and um Glenn and I have been working on something called Vibrant Colorado, which I think is going to be an amazing uh, experience and opportunity for um, the community uh, in the state to be able to, you know, take their business and their message to the next level and um, live life in, from an extraordinary um, place. And um, it is in the works, and I'm really excited to see um, – how it unfolds. Um, I also am a red hat Qigong energy healer. <laughs> healer. Do you like how I said that? <laughs> I did. I thought you'd re really renamed your key. service. <laughs> um, and for those of you who are not familiar with what that is, it's um, an amazingly powerful healing modality. And it centers on the idea of releasing energy that isn't serving you and filling you with energy that does. This allows healing to take place when we can let go of certain traumas or obstacles and open up our flow. It, um, it brings our body back into balance and, to, and into its natural state of being. So it is a truly um, beautiful healing process. Um, but yeah, I'm glad to be on the show today. Thank you for um, this opportunity, Glenn. Yeah, you're deeply welcome. You're deeply welcome. So it looks like Jan is teaching her yoga class in Kauai. Lisa's had a little bit of a, something on her personal life has happened. She's our, our one of our producers in Pittsburgh. All right, so last week, Sherry, the dog mystic, there you are, we were talking about the whole concept of separation anxiety. And, of course, when you said separation anxiety, most human beings 
deal with separation. Separation anxiety might be one of the most, I don't know, prevalent. And I've been learning, I've been learning from, from people in the dog world that separation anxiety is so prevalent that it's, you know, it's, it's like an epidemic. And of course, when you brought the topic up last week, you, you took the, the point of view or the position that, that creating and containing the dog, and I guess particularly, particularly when they're puppies, and maybe at different stages, could be useful to the dog in the sense of calming them, secure, helping them feel secure. And then I got some feedback, and I and I was a part of the feedback that I got kind of was something I was thinking about that I that every time I think about my dog or I had a Rottweiler, I never we never caged him. He pretty much had run of the house, and every time I could bring him, I did, which is very often. And I learned there was two states that. that there was two states a dog could be in. One was electric. That's when they'd be more prone to biting or they'd be just overly excited. And then magnetic. And I learned that, you know, that given the dog the chance to get to become magnetic, they, like Ben would do that. I mean, but in the morning, sometimes he was way overhyped and he would actually chase cars in the morning. Unless they took him for a long walk and he settled, he was sort of unbearable. But that was just for a brief moment. So your whole thing last week is that, that crating was one of the options that people could take to settle the dog and have the dog kind of. Sometimes when, when the dogs have free roam of the whole entire house, then, Mm -hmm. and they have a whole bunch of toys, then once they get bored of the toys, then of course they're going to, they, they can start chewing on um, other things, whether it's furniture or um, your shoes. So I mean, like, you know, it's, it's, um, the way to look at, at the confinement is more or less if you wouldn't allow a crawling baby to just crawl around and not watch what they're doing because everything that they find, they're going to put it in their mouth. So it's the same thing with a puppy. So that's where the the confinement is. is um, okay, mostly, mostly targeted towards, towards puppies. Yes. And I mean, like, you know, the only, the only time that you would want to confine a um a larger dog is yeah. like when you first rescue a dog then mm-hmm. keep it in in a confinement i mean and another thing that another confinement can be just like a, a laundry room or a mm-hmm. hallway and then you put a, a baby gate up so they they have that area okay. like that specific okay. area that that they're they they feel safer than the whole entire house um so, I mean, like, the reason why you want to confine the, the, the rescue dog is because you don't know exactly what happened to the dog mm-hmm. when in, yeah. when they were younger. So, if they do have separation anxiety and then all of a sudden you leave, I mean, like, the, the uh, damage, the damage mm-hmm. and the destruction that can be caused mm-hmm. from mm-hmm. dogs that have separation anxiety, whether it's biting the, the baseboards, scratching the, the doors, even bite, biting on, on the, the mm-hmm. door handles. I mean, it's it's... Yeah. You know they can they can do really large damage to their bodies, but then also major destruction to to the home as well. You know, and okay, and, um, okay. So that's that's the main thing with with the confinement. And I mean, like you know, you know in, in 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 regards to the 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 dog training that I do, I do give people mm-hmm. the option. You know, and and. If they really are against the, the, the crate training, then fine. Let's do a, a playpen. If not a playpen, then a laundry room or a hallway. So, I mean, like, you know, there's there's so many different options that we can go to. So At, so, at some point with you, Sherry, I want to I talk about some of the other things that people use. And I want to get your perspective and have some people on who are leading the field. In the, like, as an example, some people have used things like the – the Bach flowers developed by Dr. Edward Bach back in the, in the 1940s. He was an infectious disease specialist and he came up with a whole line of these flowers that he feels totally impacts the emotional and physical body. Um, and they have a whole they have many, many people use those for horses and dogs. So I want to explore some of these other things with the dog mystic to get, to accommodate more people who want to address this key issue, uh, core issue of, um, uh, anxiety and separation anxiety and how it shows up. And it might be showing up in terms of aggression. I know there's a lot of thinking on this. There's people, there's people who feel like dogs have not been so disrupted and that they're getting too many vaccinations. It's an interesting larger topic that I like to explore. But for this topic on the uh, how, how some containment is beneficial to the dog, I think has been it's clearer now. By the way, I'll, I'll let uh, 
our active uh, team members, if you guys have any comments about this containment advocacy, our dog mystic saying, any, anything, Jen, around this topic? You have a dog. Yeah, well, I actually yeah. um, just had a question. And Gus is calling in, too, right now, by the way. <laughs> He's on the little line. Um, I, you know, I personally don't create Gus, but I also have a different situation. Um, yeah. But I guess I'm curious is what um, the idea behind the energetics of it is. Because um, when I think of, like, comparing it to a baby, when a baby, you know, comes out of the womb, like, when you swaddle it, you contain it, it makes it feel more comfortable. Yeah. And, yeah. like, it's still in that small space. Is that the same idea behind the crate? Or is it even go back to, like, an instinctual thing where packed animals are in like small caves i'm just wondering if it's instinctual or if it's something where it still gives it that feeling that it's you know inside mom or just what the theory of that comfort level is um for the dog Um, when it's in the crate it's it's a lot of um it's like instinctual where the the dog feels safe in their um in, in the, the, the small confinement and especially if like, you know, you put a, put a blanket on it. So it's, it's their, um, it's their alone time. It's their, their time to just relax and sleep and, and not seeing it as, as a negative, you know, and, and, right. um, and I mean like, you know, the, the, because there's so many characteristics of the, um, of the dogs that, are just like wolves, then, you know, because the, the, the wolves um, are comfortable in, in the cave, especially when, when they have, have their puppies, um, just to know that they're, they're safe and warm and, and um, contained. So, I mean, like, you know, the crate is, is, um, is just a safe place for them. It's a safe sure. place. They feel comfortable. And you like the person leaving leaving the home because I mean in in your situation you're able to take us with you you know wherever you're going which is is beautiful but for the people who um, who have to work and and leave their dogs home or leave the puppies home then I mean like when when they're confined in the crate then the um, and and puppies sleep most of the, of the day anyway. So when they're up, then they're chewing on their chew toys and playing with whatever toys that they have, and then um, and then they're sleeping. Right. So it's um, I mean I don't I don't I, I as a dog trainer, there's way too many people that leave their house for a very long period of time and keep them keep the dogs confined. I don't, I don't agree with that, but I mean, I always, I always... wanted to make another comment about my relationship to authors and this program we're putting together. So it's called the vibrant author and vibrant voice. I like to call it dojo. It's basically, it's going to be a small group of people uh, and some of them will speak at Carnegie hall, which is another whole relationship that I had a whole, I had a relationship with Carnegie hall. One of the speakers at Carnegie hall was a guy named Eric Butterworth. And at some point I went in there, I met a lot of, so Eric Butler had a very large following. He had, this, he had this wonderful voice. It was like the heavens opened when he spoke and he would give these messages. And so what happened with me in the whole authorship thing, there was a medical doctor, his name's Dr. Richard Moss. He wrote a book called The Eye That Is We, The Eye That Is We. And so what began to happen, what happened, began to happen with me is I began to have these very deep dialogues with authors and particularly medical doctors. I was always fascinated with medical doctors. I don't know why, because uh, Paul Botter probably said it best. He's a, a, a surgeon that I was worked very close with for a while. He passed away. He's a homeopath. But he said to me, he had to become a doctor because he was traumatized by doctors. He had to become a doctor because he was traumatized by doctors. He told me he was a little kid. He lived in the heavenly state. He fell out of a tree, broke his arm, and he came home and there was, one of, I guess his uncle was a medical doctor and the doctor saw him and freaked out when he broke, sort of, sort of broke an arm. So it was like an imprint. It was almost like to, to, to stay alive, I need to become a doctor. And then as he was doing this, this particular, it's called an observation exercise, a spiritual exercise where you start to observe what's happening in you, what's running you. And he said he realized he, he constructed this life to protect himself. And then he realized what he really was called to do and we put a whole seminar together, which sold out within a week, which was kind of this deep calling of what is real health? How do we cultivate it? So 
I think for me, uh, doctors early on, because my mother put doctors on a pedestal. Funny enough, I would work with Dr. Michael Greenberg, who wrote a book called Off the Pedestal, Returning to Healing. Uh, the thing that I did with Richard Moss, we dove into, like we did a series on the Ultimate Hospital. What I, what I sort of discovered in the author world, what I, what I wanted to bring you guys as authors, is another whole way to really be an author, tie that in with being a, a vibrant speaker and really owning your vibrant voice. And also, um, uh, there was another doctor who actually impacted me greatly, uh, Dr. Brujoy. So what Dr. Brujoy pointed out, which I always, I, there's some things we cannot put into words. I don't know if put certain things into words, but one of the things he would do is he had these, he had these 10 day retreats he would lead. And on these 10 days, people would have radical healings, like significant healings, diseases would fall away. And he was saying up until they went back to town, so the, this was at a, there was a mountain called Lone Pine in California. And people would go to Lone Pine with Dr. Brujoy. And so what he was saying is when the outer mind gets familiar again, the, the disease patterns kick in again. And he called that, he kept talking about the outer mind. And I related to it. I was thinking, yeah, part of why I don't really like, I don't like a whole bunch of things in my life is they're known in a way where I feel a sense of disconnection, not a sense of family. I don't need to feel any sense of family. I feel like, why am I even, why am I going down this path? And yet everybody seems so happy with the known. So what I got from Brew was kind of this whole notion of the outer mind and the notion that when we return to normal, the disease starts up again. So I actually had this mission to work with Brew and he wrote another book, I, another book in the line, which I, which is interesting. So the first book, Joy's Way, was all about the opening to love in our lives. How do we actually take this thing of love and not let our outer mind dictate the show? And through that, how do we wake up our body in a way where this thing called healing becomes a daily, everyday experience? And I felt a deep connection uh, to Brew Joy. And he wrote another book. So his first book was on the opening of love and joy. And his next, his next book was called Avalanche. And Avalanche was all about the purpose of darkness in our lives. So, so Brew had done two world tours. One was on Joy's Way, and they loved him around the world. When he did Avalanche, people hated him. He said the whole audience changed. They didn't like the uncomfortableness of the topic, and yet he felt he had to reveal it. And so I still felt a strong connection with Brew. Um, but in terms, of the, in terms of the message, I was intrigued that people like, kind of loved him one day and hated him the next day. So being an author, being a vibrant author, I think is a, is a, is a bold commitment to share something that's new and that informs people who really, really want to choose this path of vibrancy and be around people and go to places like Carnegie Hall because they feel so moved to, to, to bring this message to people in the, in the written word, the spoken word, and if you will, the energy, the, the things in between the words. So my big things with authors, how do I die between the words with them? And that's what I did with, with Dr. Richard Moss. I, I did a series with him, and he came up with this term called radical aliveness. No, I didn't know how it, when I heard it, I realized that's the thing when I was growing up, I missed from most people. Like, where is this thing called aliveness? When can we celebrate this unrational, vibrating, alive state of really who we are? And usually for a lot of people, it's very rare or they're drunk or they're, they're not really in touch with this, this, you could say, ground of reality that's here. So Richard, as Richard was doing this work, he had a spiritual waking at the hospital. And he had these plants in his office. And he said they just never died. They just stayed alive. And I, I got together with Richard. And I, brought, I, I went to introduce him to another doctor. Because early on, I was very fascinated by authors and speakers. And what they ran into is that the publishing houses very rarely understood what they were talking about or kind of gave it lip service to promote these messages. So in my heart and soul now, I feel like, like our panel, I feel like being able to bring alive this message of a vibrant message is is out of this world it's a, it's a very pleasurable thing so when i work with richard about the radical liveness richard concurred with brew that people's i'll call it terminal normality terminal normality their relationship to life suppressed their energies now funny enough it gets this is going to get back to sherry so i'm, I'm with all these physicians and having these very unusual so my my by my dialogues at richard moss for one to two hours uninterrupted and he wasn't doing that with anybody else, but it was our thing. We would just dive in there and we would explore. And he also did these, these programs about hiking to the mountains called Soul. And, uh, it was called Soul. And it, was, I forgot, it was Soul and Space, I think. And he was using mountain climbing 
as a metaphor for like, how do we get ancestral that's alive as we're grounded back into our lives? So no one had introduced, I was never introduced to the body that way. I wasn't introduced to the body as a vehicle for radical aliveness and for letting our spirituality live in our body. And my next evolution was kind of, it was relational. How do we actually awake together? And then I worked closely with the psychiatrist who has, who's an author, by the way, he's an author. He's a very unusual psychiatrist. He calls me Buber. And Buber was a guy who wrote a book. Martin Buber was a Hasidic Jewish man, uh, rabbi, who wrote these books. Well, he's talking about he's talking about relationship to life and the spiritual signals. They're basically the spiritual signals that are sent and how to receive them. So one day, the psychiatrist calls me, Wayne London, and he says, Glenn, I have a Rottweiler for you. That's his latest research on Rottweiler. What's different about the Rottweiler? Well, the Rottweiler deals in life and death, death energies. And Wayne London was studying Lou Gehrig's disease, Parkinson's, basically mysterious illnesses that no one in conventional medicine has much to say about other than they're really mystified, right? It's, there was no conventional course of action that I know of to this day for Lou Gehrig's and some of these other things. As a matter of fact, some of the protocols sometimes could be suppressive or maybe more dangerous. But Wayne felt that if you could encode someone's grid, and he was writing pictures for Rottweilers, and then I, I happened to meet Sherry. And here we are today. We're going to continue about our, our show on vibrant writing, vibrant speaking. We'll go to Dr. Gail Wynn. We'll come back to Sherry. We'll go to you guys if you want to call in. And, of course, Jen, who's the now the coordinator for the Vibrant Colorado Super Duper Vibrant Association there. How would you, you like that, Jen? I just put that together just that second. <laughs> Stay with us. Your life's precious. Enjoy it. The Real Conscious Connection. Ohm Times Radio. IOM FM. Host your show on IOM FM, the radio network of Ohm Times Media, one of the more recognized brand names in the conscious community, and is backed by the extensive marketing reach of Ohm Times. Hosting a show on IOM FM immediately connects you with our extensive, dedicated community. I'm Kathy Williams, host of Sexy Mom Abundant Life radio show on Thursdays at 5 p.m. Eastern, 2 p.m. Pacific. On the show, we explore living abundantly in every area of your life. Ways to let go of limiting patterns and beliefs and to step into the flow of creativity and possibility, knowing you are supported by the universe. has taken everything and everyone I've ever loved away from me. Everything. I blew my ankle out and I got prescribed pain pills by my doctor. If making my detox public is going to help somebody, I'm all for it. So I just wish I would have had a warning. Opioid dependence can happen after just five days. Know the truth. Spread the truth. A message from Truth, the Ad Council, and ONDCP. Hello, I'm Glenn Brooks. You're listening to the vibrant. I was going to say the vibrant. I I also call myself a vibrant healing facilitator. So you're listening to the Vibrant Living Network, along with us, Dr. Gail Randall. We're going to get to in a moment. Sherry Marquez. We're going to go back to Sherry. Jen. Um, I guess I was bringing up some of those doctors because their messages and and them becoming authors. Basically, I brought those books to high school with me, and that changed my listening. And so their, their education on the outer mind, and it brought me to something, because in my family, and I want to go around the room and ask you guys what, how, what brought you to your unscripted message, how it brought you to this place of a message that wasn't scripted or known that moved you, that was a signal for you. So mine was that pretty much when I grew up, my grandmother, I never saw my girl, grandmother stand up. She was in bed all the time. I went to the hospital to see her, and she was in a harness, usually in a therapeutic pool. My grandfather, very bad diabetes, he used to hide the pie and sugars when he came over. My father, my adopted father, had chronic anxiety and just really wasn't living fully. He was very smart, which was a very confusing. It was always confusing for me when someone who's considered smart has such turbulence in their lives. Um, so I wasn't around this quality of radical aliveness. I wasn't, and I sensed it deeply. When I met Jacques Lelaine, he was so alive, and he said to me something I'll never forget. He said, most people work at dying, not living. So I had the signal sent. I felt the signal. I was working with authors. I want to ask you guys, so Jen, I'll start with you, and then we'll, we'll go around. 
So when was the moment where you felt like you, you had this other signal that was relevant and powerful for you that kind of moved you into what you're doing now as a Red Qigong healer? A red, you know, what, what was that moment? Did you feel it was a moment or you felt it was gradual? What was that like for you? Because a lot of people listening now, and I, I was a lot of children like this. They don't relate to the, the school. They don't really relate to all the conventional things. And What was that moment for you? Is that still with you, that moment, that sense of something in you that really wanted to go in a different direction? Um, I feel like it was gradual for me. I always knew there were certain, certain things I didn't agree with. And then as I started plugging into this work and actually – seeing myself shift and the people around me shift. It was this awareness that came in. Um, but I actually want to speak to something that you had said earlier when you were talking about the doctors and the um, diseases like Lou Gehrig's. Um, I actually worked on a client yesterday who is suffering from Parkinson's. And when he, I got him or he had the ability to really drop in and be completely calm and at ease, his symptoms completely went away. And while in the session, that probably lasted about 25 minutes. And, um, and when he came back, I pointed it out to him, and we had this really interesting conversation about whether it was what his body's doing when he's in complete calm or what I would like to call absolute connection versus mm. the minute that brain woke up <laughs> and triggered <laughs> again. You mm. know, um, and I think that's really profound, especially when you're speaking about healing from a different point of view it's kind of like um it's also similar to like people going to retreats and having this amazing experience where they can drop in and they can be in their bodies and they can open their mind and they can experience that connection and then they come back to reality and the brain triggers it again you know so i think (laughs) there's so many areas of our lives when we think about that that isn't there a way that we can find healing on a different level to where we're in that place more often or we're, you know, open to what is more or we're refusing to believe what a doctor is telling us or how we were raised? It's this whole like shift in perception and how we can drop into our bodies and connect with that or let go what we need to like our point of reference in order to open up to what's more, you know? Um, So when you ask me if there's like this point of time, you know, I just think it's something I've always kind of seen throughout my life and known that there's more because I've experienced myself and I've experienced it around me. And um, yeah, there's just, um, there's a lot there. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. I could really, I could really dive into that one. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. No, that's beautiful. Yeah. So in some sense, in some sense, they saw, I was saying that my work with, with Richard Moss and his book again was one of us was, was called the eye that the eye that that is we. So you were saying that when the person kind of gets brain identified or habit identified or like kind of, the, the in some sense the, the disease takes over again or or the the yeah, yeah. yeah I, I agree with her and I I wanted to address that too yes because please that's, that struck me that when the, the and what the way that Glenn called it was go back to your normal life and then your disease returns so mm-hmm. what that me is the imbalance returned because what it's really about is being in that state of relaxation or as you call it connection. Because that's the number one thing that brings people into the doctor's office is that state of of stress or not relaxation mm-hmm. or anxiety. And Absolutely. the opposite of it is the connection. It can be spiritual connection. It can be connection with knowing how to honor your body as the temple of your soul. I saw it very simply, very early on. I saw people drinking and smoking and you know, how they treated their body. And if you realize that every body is special and you realize and you come into understanding how to treat your own body and as a practitioner, you know, as if we understand that about other people, that that they are all different and if we can address them you know, specifically and individually and get them into that relaxation state and 
place of trust, and I call it complete innocence, com- like a mm-hmm. child. Mm-hmm. That that is, they heal. And of course, you know, like women are different than men. The, their social expectations, you know, we sh- we're given this body image. You know, we have to look a certain way. We have to wear toxic makeup or what. <laughs> 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 We know. You know. Are you tall? Are you fat? Are you skinny? Whatever. And it's really about getting into balance with with your specialness in your body, mind, and spirit, and residing there in balance. And then you won't slip back into that normality, disease state over and over again. And that that's some of the stuff yeah. we'll be working with people in our course, Glenn. You know, I want to I want to mention our course because. Uh, and thank you, Jen. Sherry, we're coming back to you. I feel you come in here. So, mm-hmm. so when I when I when I met Dr. Grant, Dr. Randall, I was retreating. I was really frightened. So I was in chronic retreat mode, and I wanted to bear my soul in a way. And this is sometimes this happens in the power of when you meet someone out of like innocence, which Dr. Randall just said. The thing that happened in my relationship with Dr. Randall, I, I was able to gain a quality of forwarding. So in all the work that we do, we talk about this thing where we re- retreat, but then we gather ourselves so we could forward. So my forwarding coming out of this crisis is one is I felt a soul. I felt someone that I could speak to so boldly, honestly, because, you know, it's embarrassing. It's embarrassing being in a field and you're, you're <laughs> it's not like it's a physician heal thyself syndrome. I felt like I don't know where to go. And so it was so perfect how I met Gail. Uh, you know, she's in LA. It was she knew someone who was, was a life changing mentor for me, Doctor Doctor um, Valerie Hunt. T- thank you so much. That was that was the the key moment in Jeopardy just then. Thank you, uh, Doctor Valerie Hunt. And um, so I was able to forward and ground. So there was a period, and this is going to be in our course on. Um, I'm figuring out all names today. Yeah, I don't know what it's all the names are leaving. Uh, beyond the uh, healing beyond belief. So my belief, sometimes what happens is our beliefs are un, un, unseen by us. So the chronic belief syndrome, like people say it all the time, like, you know, like in, in my mentor, our, uh, Dr. Ron Shirley said to me, his grandfather said he discovered one day, his great, great grandfather, he discovered one day in his diary when he was writing that he realized he was programmed to die at 72. So he started looking old. He got wrinkles at a predictable time. And then he realized another time that he doesn't, he, we don't got to die on schedule. So this book, Healing, Healing Beyond Belief, this course, what I'm teaching with Dr. Gail Randall, really deals with the, the enjoyable and, if you will, the um, letting the unknown reveal itself in terms of vitality, in terms of awareness. Yes, laughing, humor is a healing matter. We must bring humor in our lives. And I think this course is going to be totally designed for you. And also I'm going to share the things that meant the most to me, mean the most to me regularly with Dr. Gale. So healing by release of the course, we're going to be, you'll better learn about on Dr. Randall's uh, Instagram and we're going to be getting more into it. Um, I just love what you say, you know, Gail, I love that when you speak and I love what, 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 what Jen brought up about these two states because a lot of times what we're dealing with, we're fighting this one state called illness or disease, and we're all against it. But that war drains us and keeps us over-identified with that one state. The, the, in other words, the delusion gets all the energy and not the awareness. So the premise of this course is that the awareness is your healing gateway to a new life of healing and well-being. And that the delusion, the thing that you've called a name, that probably a lot of doctors have called it a name, it gets too much energy. Another doctor that changed my life was Dr. Nicholas Gonzalez. And he said to me he, that cancer does not kill us. And he said, he's an oncologist. He was a Sloan Kettering for 20 years. And he says, Glenn, it's the shock that people bring in their lives from the diagnosis. So on this course, we're going to really explore this physician heal thyself with a physician who's healed herself many times. It's going to be vulnerable and open. And I'm, I'm humbled and, and so excited to be teaching with Dr. Randall. Um, so say something more, Dr. Randall. Well, the one thing that you <laughs> yes. immediately moved into trust, which is great, because I was able to open my arms. You felt it, and you were yeah. you you immediately moved to trust. So you you had the awareness. That's key. That's a key step. And then you moved to trust, and then you could release. But a lot of people, even though they're coming to the doctor, they can't they can't 
open completely because they feel they're afraid that they'll yeah. appear weak. You know, they've been taught as from very young um, children that sickness, illness is weakness. So they come in and they even cover up their their wounds more. And so you, yeah. it's upon us, the, the healer, the practitioner, to work with that person to 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 trust us and to show us that wound and coax them into letting down their guard and asking for help because even though people show up at the doctor's office they still sometimes can't ask for help because of their thought viruses. Yeah. So that that's one thing we need to work on with people. I'm so excited. I want to share with people I called Dr. Randall one day in one of those moments because I felt the sky was falling. And her response to me, which struck me, so actually broke my thought virus. You said to me, it's not as if my hair's on fire. And I was like, it just it just helped me a lot. And then you said, there's always a solution. And that was a powerful, beautiful moment. Thank you. I feel the energy of that right now. So um, I want to circle back to Sherry here. So Sherry, when, when Dr. Wayne London said, uh, it's like a doctor fest today, Jen. I'm sorry. I, I don't know why I'm mentioning so many doctors. Certainly, people without degrees are sometimes the most profound healers. It just happens, I think, my doorway was through doctors who woke up again because their their healings were part of going beyond their degrees. So it was sort of unique. So when Dr. From, from, from when Wayne London told me that Rottweiler's deal in life and death issues, and I'm going to be a little mystical here. So he basically said to me, and I'm, I'm going to be out there with this, he said that basically that Rottweilers, as a breed, pull the negative gunk off the auric body. So when, if you guys are studying anthroposophical medicine, homeopathy, different energies, as we talk about the, the accumulation in the energy body of toxins. And Dr. Barry Hunt said, we don't get ill at the level of the physical body, we get ill at the level of the energy body. We get ill there. And when you clear that, it reflects back to the physical body. So sometimes too much emphasis, right? So when I learned about the Rottweilers that way, I was thinking, oh my God, these are hero healers. So my frame of reference for them was that they, they had a, a unique contribution. When I met Sherry, I thought, wow, Sherry wants to, Sherry wants to educate people so they could, dogs could be in their forever homes and that people's ignorance doesn't, doesn't supersede the wonder of the dog so that the dog is with someone who kind of gets this deeper impulse. So that was my whole thing with Rottweilers. And we had an amazing year with Ben the Rottweiler and it bonded our family. And I said, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to have a book written and get behind a book. And here it is. We have the, uh, the dog mystic. I'm being in deep tune with your dog with Sherry Marquez. I like saying Sherry Marquez. It's kind of a, it's a very easy name to say, by the way. I just, I just said well, it again. Thank you. Yeah. It has yeah. a flow to it. I like it. It has a flow. <laughs> yeah. It's a flow. <laughs> by the way, with um, Jen, with Jen and I just want to say with Jen and Dr. Randall is saying it's so, you see, I feel everything they're saying is so in the dog world. So like if you listen to the brilliant things they're both saying, the, the moments where we break normality, the moments where we let this vitality of who we are come to the surface, I feel like dogs are so much a part of that. And that's why people are in wonderment of dogs. Well, I mean, especially like I've said time and again, I, I, dog psychology is just like a child psychology. So, you know, they, we're, they're, they're so much, um, they're just so in tune. They're in tune with what's going on. And if they know they can get away with something, then of course they're going to push it for everything that they can. So, you know, they're. they're you make them sound like house burglars. <laughs> <laughs> just like children. I mean, you know, yeah. starting from two years and on, if they know yeah. they're going to get away with it, they're going to. They're going to do it. They're going to try and push their limits to uh, to no end. So, same thing with the dogs. <laughs> what's been? What's uh, been? What's been? Uh, I think you told me. A, yes. I just wanted yes. to say something really quick. Please. Is that okay. Please. Um, yeah, of course. When you said yes. that about the Rottweiler and the energetics behind, like peeling the fear off the energetic body. Yes. And I, like, yes. Sit with that. I feel like. It's because they're such a protective animal that when you have them in your home, you can connect to the feeling of safety because you don't have to take it on. They take it yeah. on for you. Yeah. So it yeah. puts your body at ease. Do you know what I mean by that? That's like so, this, okay. Mm -hmm. I love you. You language it so beautifully, Jen. So the other thing Wayne said to me is that the energy of people's illness would kill a lot of dogs, but not a Rottweiler. Right. Cause it's well, it's, it's almost... 
Good. Yeah. Go ahead. It's, it's almost like the um, what popped into my mind in regards to you know the the dog and the the Rottweilers and and yeah. fighting off the the illnesses. The, yeah. The crystals, the the black crystals. Um, I, I'm drawing a blank on exactly what they are, but I mean I know that, mm-hmm. that black crystals. The tourmaline. Actually, yes. Onyx. What are they and called? Tourmaline. Tourmaline. Onyx. Tourmaline onyx. and onyx. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, so, so any of any of the black, um, yeah, the, the the black crystals, they they take in any negative energy, and you know they they cleanse the the the, the auras. So I mean, like that's that's one thing that just like popped into my mind in regards mm-hmm. to the cut into the, the the black rot, rottweilers. <laughs> yeah, I had a patient that had three rot, rottweilers. Really, they, really. They have, Three different uh, diseases that she had. Mm. Mm. Oh wow! Colitis and well, unfortunately, cancer. But mm. they they are like that. Mm. So mm. the woman had three different illness, illnesses. These illnesses and her Rottweilers took them from her. Wow! Wow! Beautiful. I'd like to get her in the book. Dr. Randall, Gail, I'd love to. I'd love to have that person be in Sherry's book. I think that's. Did Did she say that to you? Did Did you discover? Like, how did you come up with that? How did, was that apparent to you as a mystic yourself? Well, I don't feel it was so mystical. I mean, she had it. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you got another one, and then it, it three times. Uh huh. Okay. Right. So, with with your with your healing, um, with your healing that you were doing with, with her, and the dog, um, just the 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 dog's beings and 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 um, helping it, helping her go through, you know, all the um, whatever pain that she was going through, you know, that's, that's the, that's the beautiful thing about, about the dogs is they're there. And, they're, and when, when they're Glenn there said that, I immediately thought of her and thought of her dogs and hmm. taking the karmic crud off them. I mean, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. Well, you know, I, so Wayne would have, the doctor would have a, a, he did this whole intake about the grid so the whole his whole premise is, is that if we if we're not able to deal with the incoming outcoming energy, and we get sick, we get he called it being stuck in the grid. He even he call it being stuck in the grid. That things like Gulgaris disease, Parkinson's, these mysterious illnesses, that was because the energy wasn't transferring and there wasn't proper purification. That was it. So he came up with, believe it or not, he studied tennis in relation to that because tennis changes the grid. Uh, light is an example. You know, we need sunlight. It changes, it transforms us. So the first time I met him, he was telling me what happens when people don't get the correct amount of sunlight. And also mystically, the people who are um, watch stoppers, they disturb computers, they love thunderstorms. These people also prone to like chronic fatigue, but yet they're very attuned. And he was saying they're totally missed by most doctors. They don't, doctors don't get this. And, and they, they're specific, specifically attuned to different energy factors that once they realize it and bring it into their life, they now have this thing called harmony. Right. So harmony is really, you know, when you go to a doctor, it's not just stopping symptoms. And my relation to Dr. Gale, she hung in there with me in the hallways and cracks of, of the process. So we go to the doctor, you get some relief sometimes or you get a lot of medications, but it's the process that allows us to become in tune with harmony. And that's the process we'll share with you in the uh, Beyond Belief Healing. And that was a process that I had with Dr. Gale. And it's sort of the process of my life. And it's sort of getting, okay, so I'm going to leave you guys with this. This is a keynote for the course. I want you guys to write this down. It's basically the premise that all symptoms are healing in progress. That all symptoms are healing in progress on one level or the other. And it's the ability to allow symptoms to reveal themselves in a way that we get in more harmony. Um, so dogs have been that for me as well. I go to the, the dog park every day. I interact with dogs every day. And right now, and I know that Sherry says this to me, and it's probably going to be 100% true. There's two dogs I feel particularly akin with. I've had meetings with people uh, in these two groups of dogs, and I love them to pieces, but it might change. So right now it's the Malamuth, which has ancient DNA. 
it's it's almost as close as you get to a wolf. Their energy is wondrous and mysterious. Uh, they have a mind of their own, yet they totally love you. And then the white Swiss shepherd. So just you just wanted to put that out there. And of course, mm-hmm. distantly Gus, because Gus is part of the healing team now. <laughs> Gus is Jen, Jen's dog, the coordinator, and the I'm a coordinator and facilitator of uh, Vibrant Colorado. So. So let's go on. Why don't you guys leave leave the audience with? Uh, oh, I just want to plug next week's show. Actually, I got a, a few moments. So next week, part of next week's show, we're going to talk to Allie, who suffered two traumas. She was um, so one trauma. She she was in a situation where she got really brutally injured, invaded upon, and the secondary injury was she had a brain injury, and her story. It's so beautiful, and there's so much to not just learn intellectually, but just the spirit of how she tells her story is really coming into an awakening and a sense of wholeness and harmony that you won't want to miss. So that'll be next week, and also uh, Jen will be on that segment. With you. I mean, we'll all be here next week talking with Allie about her her aliveness journey back from what the neurologist said to her, because, quote-unquote, you'll always be on medications. You won't recover from this. So we'll talk about the outer language that would have kept her in a certain prison and how she really became free. And now she's freer. And it's always been a blessing for you to interact with her. So I'll be next week. Um, did you want to leave a mystical insight for the audience, Sherry? Did you want to leave something today around, around if someone's looking for a healing dog, I'm talking about why, well, is someone's looking for a Christmas present and they want a dog. What would you say about finding a dog that suits you? Or that could be a healing agent in your life. Um, I, the most important thing is research the breeds before you, um, you know, before you just get like if you're if you're rescuing, then like research the the certain characteristics because you know there there are certain characteristics that um, that are the same for the breed. So it's more or less if you're a relaxed family, then you don't want to get a Jack Russell or a, um, you know, like a rat terrier (laughs) because they're extremely hyper and they're high energy. So, and if you're high energy, then you don't want to get a, um, like, you know, another, um, another dog. So I mean, like research the breed before you get, get the, like just spontaneously adopt a dog and, um, and don't, don't get a puppy less than eight weeks old. So, okay. oh, you, okay. all right, all right. Just now, because they, they, they need their mother and their family just to learn, learn the basics and, and for the nutrition as, as well. So they're, they're, okay. it's a whole learning process that they're with their, you want to leave, you want to leave us, you, you want, what, what website are you, you going to leave with us today? What's the um, website? I'm going to leave um, smartpawsdogtraining.com. SmartPawsDogTraining.com. That is All right. Beautiful. Fun. Now, Jen, you're writing an article. That I, I, I know this is going to be a big question for you, but your article is called What to Do When Your Dog Doesn't Celebrate Christmas. Apparently, Gus cel- just is celebrating Hanukkah. Did you want to leave any, anything? I just felt you could answer that so well because you're writing the article. Oh, my God. Could you please, the, 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 <laughs> Dr. Gail Randall? Perfect. Oh, my God. Wait, go, go, to, go, to, go, to the, go to your website, Jen. Okay, we'll go right back to Dr. Randall. Um, go ahead. Jennifer Rowe, R-O-E, thehealingrow.com. Thehealingrow.com. All right, my beloved healer, Dr. Gail Randall, go out, go out and give out all your wonderful wisdom-filled stuff. How do people learn about you, read about you, all that kind of thing? drgmrandall.com and Instagram, Dr. Gail Randall. My love to you guys. Happy holidays. We'll be with you next week. I'm Glenn Butch for The Vibrant Living Life. It doesn't end here. It keeps Thank beginning. You. Thank you deeply. Have a wonderful week. Bye.